in the next few videos, we're going to be talking about Porter's Five Forces, and I want to beg an indulgence from you. Uh, you probably feel like you know Porter's Five Forces well. You've probably heard it in a couple of classes, but I have to tell you, I, I find very few people who I think really understand Porter's Five Forces and, more importantly, know how to employ them in a useful manner. So let me introduce you to the Porter's Five Forces. They're on the screen. Uh, you know them. The threat of new entrants, the power of the buyer and the supplier, substitute products, and the rivalry among competitors. You see the way they're arrayed, the buyers and suppliers is, is uh, on the horizontal uh, axis with the industry in the middle and the rivals in the middle. Incidentally, one of the trickier things about correctly doing a quarter spy forces is knowing what to put in the middle. And that is the industry in which a company operates, whether either if you're looking at an industry, obviously you're not looking at one particular company. But if you're doing it from a company perspective, you've got to make sure that you put them and the appropriate rivals in the center uh, in the image uh, industry. The question is, what do we do with Porter's Five Forces? And so you can throw out the pithy, oh, it's, uh, it's an industry analysis tool. Yes, but what does that mean? So let me depict it for you visually. Porter's Five Forces is a story of power, and it's power over what? Profitability. So I've got four $1 bills, and then out here are 110, and I'll explain to you why in just a minute. But this is how it's a story of the five forces. So in the first force, the threat of new entrants, which we'll talk about all these in detail, when you have a high threat of new entrants, companies tend to do something about it. They lower their prices, they improve their product, they do something to make it harder to enter which usually costs the company money and the dollar goes away. And then you have buyers. These are your, your people who purchase your product to the extent that they become more powerful. Another dollar goes away because they dem demand better service, uh, cheaper price, something like that that costs you money. Same thing for suppliers. They charge you more for the raw products you need and another dollar goes away. And then you have substitute products. And these kind of set an upper boundary as to what you can charge, or they force you to do improvements because they're getting better, and there's another dollar gone away. And then lastly are my rivals. Now, the reason I put a 10 here is not because it's 10 times more powerful than any of the other forces. That really isn't at all the case. But this is where typically the rivalry gets triggered, and this is where you can fritter away a lot of money in price wars uh, and the like. And I'll give you some examples of that as we talk about that particular uh, segment of the five forces. Now, incidentally, who's the big winner of these $10? It's the customer, because as companies fight, the beneficiary is the customer. And so that's why one of the reasons competition is good because at the end of the day it forces companies to offer more to their customers to make things work. So Porter's Five Forces is a story of power and of profitability and that's why I think it's such a useful tool to look at what's going on in an industry. Let me change the slide to the first force, the threat of new entrants, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this slide uh, because we're going to understand some very important con concepts. At first, I tried to talk about uh, basic uh, economic considerations. So the first is low economies of scale. The threat of new interest is greatest when there are low economies of scale, which is to say it's just as easy to produce one as it is to produce 100. Now, here are some, some uh, industries with very high economies of scale. They tend to be uh, very complete manufacturing companies, such as the auto manufacturers, the airline manufacturers uh, because there's a lot of economies of scale there. It costs a lot to produce the first one and to, produce, to make the production system, much less to make each subsequent one, so uh, it's hard for somebody to enter on a small scale. Uh, you can see that on the service industry too though, think of how hard it would be to launch a nationwide package delivery system. Well you've got to have all these people nationwide from the get-go and that's tremendously expensive, and if you don't have instant high volume, it's economically unfeasible. So that's a barrier to, to uh, entry. Um, 
Next is low capital requirements. If it's very inexpensive to enter an industry, people will do so. Uh, an example of this here locally is when one of the major employers in town shut down several years ago, St. Cobain Vetrotex. My friends at the Small Business Development Center said they counseled so many people that wanted to start their own lawn care business because it takes $1,000 to $2,000 to get the necessary equipment, which is why you see all these trucks driving around Wichita Falls with the little magnetic signs on the side, pickup trucks driving a trailer with lawn equipment. A lot of people found it very easy to get into that industry because of that, because it's so easy to enter. What about the pricing? Really relatively cheap to have these people do the work for you. But one caveat on the capital requirements, and that is um, if it's easy to raise money to get into this industry, then the capital requirements are not a deterrent. Uh, an example of high capital requirements would be a biotech company. It costs a lot of money to get a, uh, to get a product through all the FDA clearances if it's going to be used in humans. That's a tremendous uh, barrier to entry, and that keeps the number of companies that try to do that relatively low. Um, I'm going to hold off on low switching costs and a little differentiation for just a minute and talk about uh, e easy access to distribution and government policy. These are constraints on uh, getting to the customer in a sense. Now government policy, uh, the thing I want you to see about this, I apologize for the stuttering, is how people manipulate this. An example of government policy. A lot of uh, professions require licensing that doesn't necessarily make sense. I recently had a niece of mine earn her beautician's license in another state, not Texas, but I think it's very similar to Texas. And she literally spent over a year getting licensed to cut hair. And of course, they justify it by saying, well, you know, a lot of chemicals, dying hair, dangerous, blah, blah, blah. I got to tell you, I don't believe that for a minute. What happened was the people who cut hair for a living at one point in time lobbied the state legislatures to pass these very high licensure requirements and the companies that offer the training classes to get the license fully support them because it suppresses the number of new entrants. In theory it would be easy to say you know what I, I think I could learn to cut hair in a few weeks I'm very good with my hands I could do that. You can but you can't do it legally and so that is a government policy requiring a license that's a barrier to entry. And there are many other things like that. So you'll see companies and trade associations that will wicker, try to wicker with government policy to, to create entry barriers to keep down competition. Easy access to bit distribution channels. A couple of years ago, we had a gentleman win in IDWF, one of the winners, uh, and his idea was custom wood caskets. I know, kind of a morbid uh, product, but he, he built a beautiful casket, truly. Where are most caskets purchased? Funeral homes. Actually, and incidentally, doesn't have to be. In the state of Texas, uh, a funeral home has to use any casket that's brought to them. They cannot discriminate. Uh, but that said, most people still buy uh, their caskets at the funeral homes. There is one company called Batesville that basically has the market cornered. And here's an example of how they keep new entrants out. There are many of these funeral homes who stock nothing but Batesville caskets. And Batesville has a deal with these companies that if they sell X number of Batesville caskets and nobody else's at the end of the year, they'll get a prize, trips to Hawaii and the like. So they have a very anti-competitive tactic. And it's hard to break into a lot of funeral homes with these caskets because Unless they're going to sell them in high volume, the funeral homes are like, it's not worth it because Batesville cuts us a good deal if we don't sell anybody else's caskets. The reason I wanted to put aside differentiation and switching costs is because it's such an important concept, it's going to take several minutes to explain it. So join me in the next video when I dive into it.